Um, so today's session is on uh, virtual site visits. So we will be speaking today, all of you are current site visitors, uh, team chairs and team members. Um, and so we, we thank everyone for joining us to learn a little bit more about our brand new time limited uh, virtual site visit process. Um, people are still kind of filtering in here, uh, but we wanted to take a little bit of time today uh, to talk with you all about what's so different about this virtual site visit process. Why do we bring it online? Um, and what does it mean to all of you uh, as site visitors uh, when you are gonna be out there in the field? So today I am joined um, by three of our team chairs that worked on our pilot visits. Uh, Dr. Neil Duchik from uh, Kennesaw State, Dr. Kelly Coker from Palo Alto University, and Dr. Uh, Marty Gensius from Kent State University. Uh, they were the chairs, as I noted, for our three pilot visits. Uh, so I'd like to uh, give them all a moment to just say a quick hello to everybody, and, to, uh, and then we'll start into a little bit more about what these virtual site visits are. Neil? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to be here. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Um, and we look forward to sharing some of our experiences. And I also would just say if there are any folks on the call who participated with either Neil, Marty, or myself as team members, uh, we're hoping we'll have a chance to hear from you a little bit today as well. Yes, definitely. So no pressure on you all, but yeah, if you, if there are, there will be a point where I'll give you a chance to um, those team members that have decided to join us today to, to jump in and just say a little bit more about what it's like to be a team member during these visits. Um, so because we are having just team chairs helping us do the main presentation today, um, but we do want to acknowledge that uh, there's a slightly different role and just as important role um, with those team members for uh, these visits as well. Um, and then I will pass it on to Marty. Yeah, I just, um, I'm happy you're all here. I think it, this puts us in a situation that's unique for all of us. I keep my expertise in check by reminding myself I'm only one tele-accreditation ahead of the rest of you. So I think you'll learn a lot from the process when you are actually uh, in the process. So I'm excited about today and we'll just share what our individual experiences are when the time is right. Thanks, Marty. All right, so uh, as I noted, the virtual site visit process um, is really something that we've been developing over the last about three months uh, since the time that many of your all campuses and campuses across the United States um, have closed down, have had travel restrictions, um, have been experiencing, uh, you know, delays in, and, and changes in the way that they operate. So we too are looking at ways that we can change our operations and continue to support uh, the accreditation process. Uh, as I noted, this is going to be a time limited process um how long that will be we don't know at this point as you know many of us uh, and many of you know um, institutions are making different decisions uh for the summer for the fall um and into the spring even of next year uh so we don't know how long we'll be doing this for but uh for the time being this is something that we want to uh, get all of you as up to speed on as possible so that we can uh, best serve all of our programs. Uh, I'm sure many of you, um, all of you received from me the handbook supplement that we're giving to our programs um, to help them through this process, telling them a little bit what we're expecting of them. Um, that kind of lays out the standards for how do you get um, asked to be on one of these virtual site visits um, as a program. Um, and then it looks at you know, how, what, what are you going to do? How is this the same? How is this different from that? Um, you know, the first thing to say is a virtual site visit is not a supplement to an on-site visit. If you choose to be part of the virtual site visit as a program, 
you're accepting that as the visit review of your program. So there won't be any kind of follow-up, um, you know, unless any different than there would be follow-up for a normal in-person visit. Um, so these visits in some ways are not exactly, they're not, they're a full scale replacement for, and we hope very much an equivalent um, level of review. Uh, See, so, you know, what I'll, what I'll start off by saying is saying basically these visits are no different. Um, you know, a lot of the experiences that our team chairs have expressed from going on the pilot visits, you know, equate pretty well uh, with what, what they've seen when they've done standard on-site in-person visits. Uh, so I guess I would just open it up now uh, to our chairs. I'll, I'll start with Neil. Um, and Emil, if you just want to talk through a little bit, kind of how your experience was similar, kind of some of the things that you, uh, you know, unexpected things, just just your overall feeling of of, of being out on these uh, these virtual visits. Sure, um, I I would say overall that our experience was very positive uh, for, for for my group, my team. Um, we found a lot of similarities uh, to to you know a traditional visit. Uh, Met a lot of interesting people. Uh, we were able to, um, our, our interactions with those individuals seemed, seemed a little bit more focused uh, than they, they typically would have. Um, you know, generally you have that talk in between different, uh, different meetings and things like that. And we didn't necessarily have that ability. Uh, so, so we were, we were pretty, uh, pretty uh, w when we did actually have the opportunity to interact with individuals, we, were, we tend to be a little bit more direct and we were a little bit more, more matter of the fact. But, Besides that, I think there were there were a lot of similarities. Um, you know, the students uh, received us very well. Um, you know, we were fortunate because uh, our our the university that we looked at had a had a good uh, understanding of technology, uh, and so I think that was a real benefit to us as well. Um, and I'll open it up to Kelly and Marty to to comment as well. I would I would echo what Neil was saying. It felt like a site visit. Um, it included all of the key meetings and conversations that you'd want to have in a site visit. Um, I had the ability and my team did as well to access and review all the files and information that we normally would on a site visit. Uh, and we had really good coordination and collaboration both among team members with the liaison and with the institution. Uh, I would say a couple of the differences, it's more tiring just something about sitting in front of a screen that long. Uh, it, it definitely was taxing, I think, both for myself, the team, and the program. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I think it, it felt to me like, and of course, I've only done one of these, uh, so maybe this was just a little bit of my own anticipatory anxiety about it, but uh, it felt like it did need a little bit more upfront planning. Uh, so opportunity to connect with the liaison, with the team ahead of time, um, and also do the tech visit, which I'm sure Marty or um, Jonathan will speak to more. Marty, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, I, um, I and with all good affection, refer to the, the experience as being very two-dimensional. Um, in the idea that we're, we're not, there's a, a lot of the nuance that you get from site visits um, and the relational stuff that happens with your team um, is difficult to happen um, doing this in a condensed version. So if you can uh, kind of give that piece up, it also helps you target in and focus on the work, I think a lot more, which is a plus. Um, I'm not gonna beleaguer a lot of the uh, same points that Neil and Kelly uh, mentioned. I saw one real distinct advantage was instead of having site supervisors all come down, spend an hour traveling to the, to the site, and then having a 45 minute meeting with you, and then spending another hour traveling back to their sites, it was very convenient for them to come in um, using the technology. And um, I think that led to uh, a lot more availability uh, for them with that than you would typically see with people coming to on-site uh, type accreditations. 
Um, so that's that's my piece. We have some other points we can talk about um, later on that uh, Kelly, Neil, and I had chatted about. So I'm going to turn it back. Thanks, Marty. You know, I, I think that the first thing that um, now that you've all kind of introduced what your overall kind of feelings were and things, uh, one of the really things, first things to get to is how is the scheduling different? How does the how does the pre-visit um, stuff kind of happen? Uh, yep. I, I guess in our notes, uh, I was supposed to talk a little bit about the schedule, so I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about that. Uh, so we we met and discussed the schedule a couple of weeks in advance with the uh, with the person at the university and. Uh, you know, one of the things that we were really cognizant about was the amount of time that we would be spending online. Uh, so we made sure that in, in addressing the schedule, we built in plenty of breaks for ourselves. So we had approximately 45 minutes to 50 minutes of discussion, and then we took a, a 10 to 15 minute break uh, every hour, uh, with the exception of the time that we met with uh, faculty, we went a little bit over an hour and 15 minutes. But we, you know, we made sure that we had those breaks where we could get up and kind of move around and kind of uh, change uh, change up our format and stuff if we needed to a little bit. Uh, so so with that said, I, I think that caused the the actual interviews themselves to be a little bit more condensed. Uh, so we needed to be a little bit more focused oriented when we when we ask questions and and, and sought information. Um, you know, another thing that you can you can do in terms of your schedule is you can break it up where you have two or three different rooms going at the same time and you are meeting with different individuals. Uh, we did that. Uh, we did that once within our within our schedule, where I met with one group, and then we uh, other members of the team met with another group in another room, and that seemed to work uh, relatively well as as well. Um, in terms of the scheduling, uh, you know, with the rooms that we we utilized, uh, every every session essentially was in a different uh, Zoom room, and we had that on the schedule where you could just go and click on it and go automatically into into that room, which we found to be uh, helpful. And that change of pace was also also pretty nice. Um, you know, at the end of the at the end of the day, come four or five o'clock. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, you were really really tired. Uh, so we made it a point not to spend you know more than an hour in the evening uh, looking at different things and kind of talking about the, the points that we made. So uh, as we met with people, you know, our notes were a little bit more copious than than usual. We tried to make sure that we uh, you know we had specific things that we could come back to in that that hour or so that we spend in the in the evening. Uh, another important part uh, in terms of scheduling was just to make sure that we had access to technical support if we needed it. So we had the phone number of the technical support person at the university. Um, we actually uh, were, were fortunate because we had access to all of the databases the weekend before we met. Uh, and that gave us time to kind of go in individually and check out different things, different course rooms and stuff like that, which was a, which was a big, uh, big support for us. Um, you know, in, in terms of the scheduling, one thing that I, I did find different uh, was the relationships that you formed with people. Uh, it wasn't quite as, as coherent as it typically is on a regular visit, you know, where you're walking between the different rooms and talking to people. Uh, so so you, you miss that element, but, but I think, um, you know, it was done very professionally and it was uh, the group that we worked with was very, uh, very knowledgeable, very uh, easy to deal with. And uh, so, you know, in terms of in terms of scheduling itself, it was it, it actually flowed very well uh, from my perspective. Uh, we were we were we were fortunate. Thanks, Neil. Kelly, did, uh, Kelly, if you want to speak a little bit about, um, you know, one thing I'll say is Kelly's visit was scheduled a little bit earlier than other folks' visits. Um, one thing that we did change between uh, the time that. Uh, Kelly's visit was scheduled and these other two vis pilot visits uh, was KCRIP um, is now hosting and you will note that from the supplement. KCRIP is hosting all of the meeting rooms whether that's the team's private room or that's the actual scheduled meetings during the visit. Um, we have a bunch of Zoom rooms available so as Neil mentioned if you need to have parallel meetings during a visit you can work with me uh, to schedule those. If you even had needed to have one team member per per room and it's all parallel meetings, we can work that out. 
um, as long as we have enough lead time to make sure that I have that all set up for you. So uh, we do give you kind of the keys to drive that during the visit. Um, so all of the logins um, and everything so that you don't, you know, you're not beholden to me uh, being there every second and, you know, hovering over things or anything, you know, we do, do try to um, give you that freedom because I know that that can be a big shift. You will be interacting with me a lot more though uh, than maybe normal um, in our on-ground visits. I think in general, we're, we're hoping that we can be a lot more supportive throughout this process, uh, more hands-on, just really anything you need. So uh, never feel scared to ask and say, hey, I'm not really sure how this is supposed to flow. Um, just reach out to, to me uh, and, and let me know about that. So um, with that, I will hand it over to Kelly to talk a little bit about how she kind of did some of her scheduling and working with the program. Sure, yeah, we, uh, our setup was a little different as Jonathan said, our um, liaison is the one who set up most of the meetings. Uh, and, and I really appreciate, I think, the shift that's being made to have those handled more by KCREP. I mean, it went fine, she did a great job with it, but I was really aware of sort of the added stress of that on her to have to manage all of the meeting rooms as well as um, just everything else you have to do when you're a liaison. Um, one thing I do think uh, that we all did, Neil and Marty and I, whether the Zoom rooms were by the site or by KCREP, uh, is that we had the liaison at least come to the meetings in the beginning to introduce the team um, and just sort of to set the stage for the meeting and then they would leave the meeting. Uh, we also asked for in our uh, visit just a detailed list of who to expect in the meetings and that was helpful for us both to sort of manage everybody who was there and to sort of compare who was there uh, versus who was on our list. I would agree with Marty, one of the things I was surprised by by this visit is every single one of our meetings were full and sometimes had more people in them than were even on our original list. So I think the ability to do the meetings at a distance, to not have to have site supervisors and alumni um, come to campus, we had a lot of participants in all of our meetings. Um, but I'm going to kick it back to Marty now because he has some comments too, just about even some of those stuff, those things to think about pre-visit, uh, even before you're kind of getting to the, the schedule part. Yeah, um, uh, I had a site that was uh, very technology savvy. Um, and because of that, they set up some remarkable and very organized. So they set up some really remarkable connections for us made it easier for us to do this at a, diff at a distance. Um, so you do want to, uh, ahead of time, check out all of the connections that they might set up for you. Um, and that includes uh, the idea of having meeting rooms, which KCREP sets up, uh, but making sure that those are workable and your team knows how to use them. Uh, we're working on a Zoom platform and there would be folks that might not be familiar with the uh, with how to do Zoom. So it's always good to have those uh, dry runs in terms of the technology. Um, the evidence rooms that sites will set up might be on their own server. And in our case, they contain things like copies of student files um, and also other responses to the different questions that were raised. And again, our site organized it really well. But in order to do it, we had to go through a, a VPN on their site and uh, access a particular file shared, uh, sharing server to be able to get in to see that monitor. And I know we spent an hour attempting to do that. And there were two of us on Macs and one of us on Windows. And it worked pretty well for the Windows computer, but was a little bit of a, a leap for the Macs because it had to go into a, a virtual uh, Windows machine in order to make it work and have it work. Um, I would uh, suggest too, if you can do this, have dual monitors because unlike um, visits where you're uh, doing face-to-face, -face, you can't open up the book or you can't pull the sheet out necessarily. And having a dual monitor really kind of helps in terms of 
having the questions up that you want, and then also focusing on the Zoom meeting. Um, the site should provide you some ongoing technical support if needed. And Neil mentioned that in terms of his visit, having a, a phone number that they could contact. We had that on our site too, but wound up never using it because it was so well um, orchestrated and so well done. So those are my ideas about pre, pre setting up. It's all about the technology. We went in twice to test it and then um, met uh, two times to also talk about it and the process. So uh, I encourage that with your team. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, a few things with regard to the technology setup. Uh, one, I'll say um, all three of these programs were online programs um, primarily. That will not necessarily be the case for all of the programs in virtual Cypher that's going forward. So there will be varying levels of comfort amongst the faculty, varying levels of support. There is a bare minimum of support, um, IT support that we are asking of these programs, a bare minimum of, uh, of technology. You know, if we're hearing from programs that a lot of their files are in paper, that they're stored in a filing cabinet, that's challenging. That's not possible for our teams to get access to. Uh, Marty mentioned, you know, the access to a virtual desktop via VPN. That's kind of the setup that we um, are looking at on a basic level. Um, I'll have, you know, the, all the folks here speak a little bit more about uh, some of that, um, that setup in a minute, but just in general, think about when you go on site and you go to the team room and they bring you in stacks of student files. Well, now that has to all be virtualized. So uh, we have these evidence rooms, electronic evidence rooms, or you know, however, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the team needs that same kind of access. Uh, one thing we're looking to try to ensure uh, with these visits is that. Uh, you have access to that, hopefully in advance of coming on site. So some of that stuff can be front loaded. Neil mentioned a little bit that they had that, that maybe wasn't as true for, uh, for Marty or Kelly's teams. We want to try to work with, uh, with sites to make sure that for all of you going forward, uh, that that's more so true, uh, that at least a few days before the visit, you would be able to look at some of those, those documents because again, that cuts back hopefully on time during the visit uh, that the team has to spend extra time online uh, during that tiring period. Um, so I guess I would just uh, offer it up to whoever wants to jump in. Kelly, if you wanna speak a little bit about how, maybe how your site um, set up their evidence and, uh, and how that works for the team. Yeah, sure. Um, similar, I think, to Marty's experience, our institution did a really great job of setting up a, um, a virtual evidence room. It was also behind a login protected VPN. Um, we did have um, a tech meeting ahead of time uh, where we had their tech support person, the liaison and the entire team and we walked through the system. They sent us our login information. We had a opportunity to test it and practice with it. We had a couple of glitches, but their tech folks were really responsive and helpful. Um, and so by the time the visit started, we were all in, we could access anything we needed. Uh, it really was like walking into an evidence room, just like you would expect. I think one of the things to think about from a team perspective, um, and, and my team and I talk through this a bit, is really trying to think about what would we normally want to have eyes on and hands on in a regular visit and how do we ask the program to replicate that for us virtually so um, i think it's helpful to really talk through with your liaison specifically what you're looking for in that evidence room uh, so we were very um, prescriptive almost with what we wanted to see so one folder for student files that included an example of a remediation plan, one folder for practicum and internship evidence, one specifically for assessment, show us your updated plan, any data 
you want us to see. Um, so, you know, we tried to be really clear about the things that we would normally want to see. There was one folder just for the self-study and any addenda, uh, one folder for updated syllabi uh, and an updated curriculum crosswalk. And so I think the clearer you can be ahead of time with your liaison about what you expect to see in that evidence room, uh, it really does help. And what that did for the team and I, and, and getting back to just a comment about scheduling, we really tried to schedule some time on the second day for there to be team time. So it was time for us to be in the evidence room together, time for us to, if we needed like a follow-up individual meeting with a member of the faculty, we could do that then. Um, and also it was time we built into the schedule to actually work on the report because as Neil said, the the screen fatigue is quite a bit. And so I really had to get out of that model of, oh, let's do a visit all day and then let's go get dinner and let's come back together for two hours in the evening and work on this. That just doesn't really work in the same way. So being really intentional about that timing and creating space to work with your team. Um, one of the things we did, and I know at least Marty did it, Neil may have too, is I actually set up a um, Google Docs folder for the team and I um, to be a shared space that we could work on the report as we went. So we did um, use our time over the course of the visit. I said to them, please go in, put in your strengths, put in suggestions, highlight areas that we need to look at. So we did that all throughout the visit. Um, and then I was able just to delete that folder and get rid of it when we were done. So that was, that was helpful for us. Thanks, Kelly. Neil, I'll open it up to you to talk about um, how you guys worked with all the data. Um, I know that for your program uh, that they gave you quite a lot, as you as you mentioned. Yeah, I can't comment enough on how well organized the university was and how easy the liaison was to work with. We, uh, we essentially signed a release the week before and then that Friday uh, before we had a we had a two hour uh, presentation on the three different databases that we had to interact with. We had complete access to their learner management system, and then they also had a, a student database that they gave us full access to. Uh, so we could go in and look at every student file. We could look at all their assessment data. We could you know, look at anything that any of their faculty had access to, which was nice. They uh, also set up a little file folder for us where if we had asked for anything during the day, they would go in and upload it directly to that folder, and we could we could check it during the course of the day to, to see that, you know, anything we had questions about was, was there. Uh, we didn't use a, a Google Doc, similar to what Kelly had mentioned. Uh, we used the 15 minutes between sessions to kind of make notes and, and jot information. Uh, in, in hindsight, hers, her method seems a lot cleaner, uh, and, and, and we probably should have done that. Uh, good to know for next time. Uh, but, but how we did it seemed to, to, to work well for our group. Uh, I was very fortunate. I had uh, Dr. Kristen Erickson and Dr. Stephen Gatanga uh, with me, and they were both uh, both wonderful uh, to work with. Gave a lot of good guidance and suggestions, and so so felt, felt very well supported from the team. Thanks, Neil. Marty. Yeah, I had um, I I'm going to add a unique twist to this. Um, I'm on the East Coast, and the institution we were looking at was on the West Coast, and I had. Um, People, I had my team spread all across those time zones. Um, so it, it meant some uh, uh, impact on the scheduling uh, in terms of when we would want or expect uh, faculty to be responsive to us and you know, site supervisors and alumni to be responsive to us. So we condensed the schedule a little bit and started late on the East Coast, which meant we went a little later than we normally do. Um, on most visits, but that seemed to work well for uh, the team and for the site better. So take that into consideration would, would have been my suggestion. As I mentioned before, our team did such a, or our site did such a wonderful job of setting up material. Like Neil's, they had an oops folder, those kinds of things that we asked for during the day that would, would magically appear um, in the evidence box if we needed it. 
um, my strategy of working with the team, knowing that we were doing this virtual visit, knowing that we were going to be uh, spending, you know, eight hours on um, online, uh, and and it seemed like we built a lot of breaks in it, but it didn't feel like we took as many breaks as we had built into it, because when in our downtime we were getting ready for the next thing or doing that, so. Um, I spent the last hour of the day with the team of, of our day, um, with the team talking about what issues needed to be addressed and who was willing to address them. Um, I am a early, early morning uh, writer. Past 10 o'clock, I'm, you know, I'm, well, some people would say past, past early in the morning, I'm not very good. Um, but I, I just don't have the, I can't do the creative construction that's necessary in writing. So I'm waking up early to do the writing, whereas my other team members are late night writers. So it was essential for us to divide the work up that way. And because we were using Google Docs on a shared uh, space, we could see what changes people had made. Um, one of the things, if you're team chair and you're using it, I would say you need to back that up. So version it and make copies so you don't leave, uh, accidentally don't lose the work or some team member uh, deletes the main draft thinking what they're doing is making a copy of it. So I, I would just you know, take on that responsibility of versioning it. We didn't have any of those accidents, but it did work as a good way as long as we did that end of the day meeting to organize what we expected to have happen within the next day. Um, and then we could do it at, in our own sort of time zone to do it. Um, so those would be those would be my additions to the comments that Kelly and Neil have made. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, I think that that um, leads us into a good um, gives a good segue to the idea that uh, you really need to uh, divide up the work uh, for a number of reasons, um, both between writing um, reviews. Marty mentioned the difference in time zones. Um, the agenda we've built has kind of all the time zones laid out for different times. So as you build your agenda, we're being maybe a little more prescriptive than we had in the past in saying, here's kind of what you want your agenda to look like um, so that everybody's on the same page. It has a place for the Zoom links to go in there. Um, so they're, they're kind of different, a lot of different parts to Kind of piecing out the work that maybe you would do a lot more of in person and you could just do it on the fly um, that you need to be a little bit uh, more upfront with. Uh, so I, I guess I would open it up to uh, to folks, uh, team chairs here that, uh, you know, how, how did you, were you intentional about piecing out the work to different team members, um, knowing who was going where as far as meetings, if they were going to be parallel meetings? Um, and, and some of those things that, that folks should really think about. Well, for me, in a lot of ways, those things you mentioned um, happened the way they normally happen for me on an on-ground visit. I think um, most of the folks in the room who are team chairs, you know, probably um, can relate to this uh, idea of upfront when you're working with a liaison, when you're figuring out the schedule, you know, part of that final detailing is that piece anyway. So if there's three of us on the team and we're doing an alumni meeting at the same time, we're doing, um, you know, an adjunct faculty meeting, let's go ahead and put in the schedule who's going to do what. So I, I think that level of detailing Many of us already do, but I, I would agree that it's probably even more important uh, when you're doing a visit at a distance. The way the schedule was different for me than it normally is was really just two primary things. One was the added breaks that Neil talked about. I, I always struggle with that anyway in an on-ground visit, and I'm always halfway through like the first day, and I'm like, dang it, why didn't we build in more breaks? I'm exhausted, I don't have time to go to the bathroom. Um, but for the virtual visit in particular, really building in those 15 minutes and then you've got that flex time to just walk away from your computer to get something to eat or, um, as Marty said, even to, to do a quick check in with the team before the next meeting. Um, so that certainly I think was a difference. And then the other difference is just being very clear about who's going where and how you're getting there. So having the Zoom links. 
Um, one of the things we had in our visit, which was very helpful, uh, but again, this was under the model where the liaison set up the Zoom rooms, is we actually had all of the meetings populated in our calendars so that when it was time for the next meeting, I didn't just have to refer to my schedule, I actually could go to my Google Calendar, click on one o'clock, and there's the Zoom link for, you know, the alumni meeting. So, you know, that might be something to think through if you're responsible for the Zoom links, and maybe, Jonathan, this is even something that KCREP could assist with, is once you have those Zoom links, yes, you want them articulated in the schedule, but to actually have them populate on people's calendars, at least the team's calendars, um, that was really helpful to keep things structured and organized. And I would just say for our organization to the meeting at the end of the day with the liaison and then folding that right into a quick follow up with the team was really vital because it allowed us to tell the liaison what to put in the oops folder and it also allowed us as the team to really kind of nail down what our focus was going to be for the next day and what we each were going to try to work on before the next day. And so that was another way to help to kind of chunk up the work. Neil? Oh, and actually before Neil sucks, I do want to follow up on what Kelly said. Um, you heard from all of the chairs here as far as uh, some different preferences and some different ways of organizing uh, their schedule, so to speak. Um, Kelly mentioned how nice it was to have them in the calendar. Neil talked a little bit about having separate um, meeting links for each of the ones. Um, and then, you know, from Marty, we heard, um, you know, he, he had mentioned in some of our past discussions, you know, that he might prefer to have kind of a single open room where people can come in and out and you can kind of manage the, uh, manage the folks there, you know, as, as you go along. Uh, I can work with team chairs to schedule it and set things up however makes the team most comfortable, um, however uh, you find it most useful. So I'm, I'm very flexible. We just want to uh, build a system that works and, and make sure things work nicely for the team. So I'll hand it off to Neil then. Sure. Well, I think scheduling was very similar as Kelly had noted to, you know, a traditional visit. Uh, we met the Sunday before uh, just to kind of talk things over and to kind of divide things up, which I think was very helpful. Uh, well, one thing that I, I noticed that was a little bit different is, you know, when you're when you're at a traditional site, people kind of guide you in terms of the time. Uh, so I was forced to be a little bit more time conscientious, uh, you, you know, knowing that I had to be the, the first one to the room to kind of open it up and let people in. Uh, so, you know, trying to trying to be on time, being a little more cognizant of that was was a little bit more more challenging, but but I certainly got used to it. Uh, but besides that, though, I I, I found it very similar uh, to to a traditional visit. And Marty, did you have anything to add what to what you had said before? No, I I think we've covered it all. Um, I, I um, the only thing I would encourage you to do, whether you're a team chair or a team member, is uh, remain flexible. Uh, it can be as organized as it was, and ours seemed to go come off with with few flaws. Uh, we had a you know trouble getting some of the team members into a room because um, we didn't give them or they didn't use the right access code to get in, and they were running a meeting separately from me. But you just have to be flexible um, and be okay with that, and also make sure you take care of yourself and your team members or yourself if you're a team member um, in the process to make sure check in with folks a little bit more about how they're doing and what they need right now because sitting in a chair staring at a screen is is probably not what they need right now i do think we've all had to deal with some flexibility in our teaching and our work our counseling um, so this comes at a good time to ask us to be more flexible Thanks, Marty. Um, you know, I think I want to circle back around to something that uh, you mentioned uh, near the very beginning, Marty, which was this idea that the visits can be a little 2D, um, you know, that, that that's not a bad thing. Um, but I'd like to hear a little bit more from all of you on that point. I know that, uh, you know, one thing we had discussed uh, as a group is that uh, 
one thing maybe you were missing is some of that. Uh, what can we actually see with our eyes? Um, you know, can we see clinical spaces? How do we engage with some of those? In this case, the three programs uh, are largely online. They do a lot of their clinical work, their didactic work uh, virtually. That's not gonna be true um, for some of you as you're uh, going out to see programs. Uh, so just some of your guys' thoughts on how some of that felt, how we can um, adjust to, to deal with that. Uh, one thing I will note is we are asking programs going forward, if they have an on-campus clinic, is there a way to provide us with some sort of a, you know, a walkthrough of that space, even if there's no, you know, no one there, can they do a video? Could they do photos with a description of, you know, what we're looking at in a PowerPoint, you know, it doesn't have to be flashy and, and high production value, just something that gives the team a good idea of uh, what and how and where are students able to, to engage with this. Well, I think, you know, for me, the, the, the way in which the 2D part was probably felt most by um, my team and I, and I'm not sure, I can't tell there's so many faces here. I don't know if, uh, Heather or Shannon are here. So if you are, I certainly invite your thoughts about it too. But if I do this again, I think one thing that I will do more intentionally is to really focus in with both site supervisors and students who are in practicum and internship, if we just have a group meeting with those folks, is to ask for some specifics. You know, pick a site supervisor, tell me about your site. What is it like? what a student's um, experience when they're there, what kind of client loads do they have, how do you do direct observation, just really trying to, to be intentional about the questions that I would ask if I were doing a, a visit to a site. Um, and similar with students, you know, really wanting to find out from those students in practicum and internship, you know, what opportunities do you have at your specific site for professional development, what types of clients. So, you know, I think that would be something that you can't quite replicate um, in the virtual visit that you have the benefit of in an on-ground visit. So I think some real focus and intentionality about getting the context of the clinical experience um, would be important. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, Neil, if you want to talk a little bit about your experience with that. Sure. I do think we tried to be intentional in some of the questions we ask. Um, you know, one thing that Marty mentioned a little bit earlier is that there were there were more site supervisors, right? Uh, which was, I think, beneficial because you could you could hear more about what the students were doing, and and so, you know, with respect to the two dimensional piece, you actually you actually gained a lot more information from from various sites, which I found to be you know, pretty, pretty helpful. Uh, I think we were pretty intentional in the questions that we ask of the, of the students related to their sites. Uh, you know, certainly I, I agree with Kelly, our questions could probably be a little more, a little more direct, a little more prescriptive next time. Uh, but, but, you know, for what we, what we had for a first shot, I, I think that we were, you know, I felt pretty comfortable with the results. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. I, I, I we were lucky because we had programs that were used to doing this work online. So uh, they came, and, and I think it also reflects the liaison and the preparation of the program, but all of our people came to talk. We didn't really have to, and you might have all been on site visits where you're sitting with a group of folks and you're starting to ask questions, and it's a slow, slow boil before you get to something. Um, I, and that might just be the nature of how prepared people are. Now, you'll be working more so uh, with folks who have not, are not online programs. And those folks, although they, everybody's an online program now, um, uh, people are getting used to communicating more and more this way. So I'm thinking uh, you'll, even with the uh, brick and mortar sites that you're doing, these teleaccreditation visits with that you're going to have uh, probably more conversation than you would expect. 
So uh, I don't know if you can just pin it on the back of the fact that we're doing this using video conferencing in terms of how much people are willing to talk and share. But I think it's going to get better uh, for everybody. Jonathan, if I could just add one thing. Another benefit I thought was that, uh, you know, our site supervisors were kind of spread out across the country. Uh, and, and so I found that very validating when they were saying the same things. Uh, you know, and, and I thought that that was, you know, that spoke highly of the, of the program and, and the different elements that we were looking at. So I would just add that. Awesome. Thanks, Pim. Um, you know, I think that uh, what I'd like to do at this point is, um, you know, Kelly asked if any of her team members were here on the call. I didn't find any either of yours, Kelly, um, but if either folks from uh, Neil's team or Marty's team um, want to talk a little bit just about their experience um, in this process, uh, just more generally as, you know, what did it feel like to be a, uh, a team member on one of these visits? Um, you know, I'll open it up for, for a few minutes for, for any folks on, on the team uh, to say something about it. And if you don't want to, that's totally okay as well. Hi, I'm Dr. Kristen Erickson. I was on um, the team with um, Dr. Neil Duchek and um, Dr. Stephen Gatanka, an absolutely wonderful um, team leader. Um, Stephen was a wonderful team member. Um, it was um, a really good experience um, working with them both. A um, couple things um, for me that I um, echo uh, all the comments that folks have said um, so far, but what did want to um, comment on a couple things that I thought were um, interesting and would be helpful to keep in mind um, for folks. Um, the dual monitor aspect, oh my gosh, I can't, if you have that luxury, <laughs> that is helpful. I think as a team member, one of the things I wrestled with is um, I didn't want to look like I was looking down reading something, but I also wanted to see people on the screen. I didn't want to read the screen. And then you can change your screen so you can still see people and still read, but, but you can't see everybody when you do that either. And so, um, that like if there is a way to have a dual monitor um that kind of thing would be so handy and if you don't to be able to um print print them out one of the things um uh neil was so wonderful with mon um modeling things um for us and there's one point where he said hey you're gonna see me look down um and i you know wanted to just let you know that's what i'm doing i printed this off um while i read it and uh, i appreciated um that just knowing that oh yeah that's okay to do um but also it's helpful to let people know that that's what you're doing because sometimes on screen um it's a little weird when people look away and you're like, what's that? Or if they look down and you're like, what are they doing? Um, one of the things I did find interesting as far as um, a couple of the folks with the, the meeting is I could see their eyes going like this across the screen and it, it did get me wondering if they had like um, printed something out to like, oh yeah, I want to make sure I remember to say this or something. And um, it didn't bother me so much because what they had to say was um, very appropriate and fitting and stuff, but I did Find that interesting. Um, I loved that we took all the breaks that we did. I can't thank um, Neil enough for thinking of that. Um, can't thank Jonathan and Neil enough for um, setting up the schedule the way that they did. I thought our schedule flowed really, really well. And it was uh, wonderful to be able to um, be able to take that little break, just come back right on track, and you knew exactly which link to click, and it was um, so easy, so simple, um, and so, uh, like, Neil just made it look like it flowed so well um, in that regard, And but I also know that it takes tons of prep for it to flow that smoothly, um, and so that would be um, people like Jonathan and um, Neil and the, um, our liaison person setting that all up in advance. So from a team member perspective, it was so refreshing um, to be able to do that. Um, I missed some of the um, little subtle small conversations. Um, what was interesting is we still found ways to weave in a, a few of those um, <laughs> anyways with um, whether that was just us as a team or, or whether that was with some of the people um, that we were meeting with like you know towards the very end of, of things as we were wrapping up or um, a particular meeting or in the beginning. Um, and it, um, one of the things I um, there were sometimes so many people on the screen um, 
and that that doesn't always happen in the in person like you know the number of people that come to some of the meetings varies quite a bit and um so so that was interesting especially for introductions because that does mean um having a lot more focused um um, questions and maybe not answering as many questions um, and can't echo enough the being flexible um, uh, Neil and Steven are, and myself were all really easy going and so so that helped um, quite a lot with some of those things um, and working on the report as we um, went along that helped a lot in being able to divvy up some of those aspects um, but there's only other one other comment I wanted to um, share and this is probably um, I hesitate sharing it because it's actually kind of embarrassing that it happened um, but my um, cat at one point um, jumped in the background and that was pretty embarrassing for me. It was, <laughs> and the timing of it was like embarrassing um, as well. And uh, you know, it is kind of one of those things that people were understanding about, but um, there wasn't a way to put my cat in, you know, a room for eight hours. <laughs> um, and also my cat has a really loud meow and I did try it once before and somebody said, is that my cat? Is that my cat meowing? And, and uh, so I knew not to do that this time. And thankfully it only happened, um, you know, the, the one time in an embarrassing manner, but it is something to think about um, how you want to handle that <laughs> um, if you have pets. Um, and that's probably all I, I have to share this time. I really had a great experience and loved doing it and um, would love doing it again um, as well. And um, shout out to the awesome team I worked with. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, that's that brings up a really good point. Um, obviously, a lot of folks are going to be doing these visits from home. Um, you know, that may mean different things for different folks, whether you have pets or children or or other, uh, you know, other distractions that could come up. Um, obviously, you can only limit those so much, uh, you know, so that, but it is something just to, to keep in mind as you go along, how can you work to limit some of those? And also, you know, if there is something that's, that might come up, uh, how can you uh, try to minimize it? So if, if people uh, have, uh, if you can let people know, hey, by the way, my cat might come in at X time and start me on and it needs food or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and I definitely, I see Kelly popping up because I know that she has some animal friends that uh, often pop into her, uh, her calls. You so. know, I was going to talk about my animal friends. Actually, what, what I was going to say, um, because I just love that, those comments that Kristen gave, and, and it sort of reminds me too of what Marty was saying about flexibility. One of the things I did talk about with the liaison, and actually we said our first meeting of the day was with the full faculty. And one of the things I really tried to do in that meeting was just level set all of our expectations of, first of all, just how weird this is, and we all get that it's weird, and that this is probably gonna be a flawed process, and we're all gonna be patient with one another, and we're just gonna roll with it, and we're gonna know that we're all doing this from our home spaces that we're sharing with various other people and creatures. So we actually talked about that very first thing on that very first morning. And I think what it also did is it just sort of for all of us, just normalized the fact that, you know, the guy could show up and ring my doorbell and my dogs could start going crazy at any moment. And, and if we just all named the fact that we're having to do this in this very unique way and that anything like that that happens is just cool and we're all just going to roll with it and be fine and then move on and it felt just important enough to just say it because as we all know the the site visit is anxiety producing enough these programs are very aware that they are the mavericks for us in this process so they're very keen on getting it right um, so i think just you know, having that sort of flexibility and that grace and that opportunity just to, you know, I mean, there were times we just had to laugh about a couple of the technical things. There was a time where our liaison got us going in one meeting with all the like university leadership. And then she went to try to open another meeting. Well, you can't do that in Zoom on the same account because you kick everybody out of the first meeting. So we all got completely kicked out of the meeting and 
So I had her, this is another good tip, I think, you know, having, um, I had phone numbers in front of me of all my team of the liaison, the tech support, and actually the faculty. So I was able to just send her a quick text and say, hey, we got kicked out of the meeting and she was able to get right in and get it going. And of course was profusely apologetic and we all just laughed about it and was like, hey, that's the kind of thing that's gonna happen. So, you know, I think, I think having that flexibility with the cat's gonna be there, the kid's gonna run in, the doorbell's gonna ring. It's just, it is what it is. Thanks, Kelly. Uh any other team members that uh, joined us that want to say anything else? Um, and after that, I'll have some short comments and then I'll open up the floor for questions from folks to me or to any of the chairs. All right, so uh, if there isn't anybody, oh, Tara, oh. Oh, sure. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'll just echo what um, Kristen has said as well, too. We were on a different site visit. I had um, Marty, but um, organization was really was key. And, and we had a Marty's very organized and our team or our, our site was very organized as well, too. Um, as Kristen said, dual monitors would be very helpful to have, um, but not always helpful or not always available. Um, the Google Docs that we used worked really well. And so um, that was a great way for us to all see the same document, see the same material that we were looking at and still discuss. Um, the only suggestion I might consider after I was, um, upon thinking about it after we finished, um, we were on different time zones. And so that meant um, like lunches and things like that where we're all different time zones there. And so we did have those short breaks, which were very helpful to get up and stretch and walk around as needed. Um, but you might you might consider like the different time zones there, um, like for lunch lunches and things like that. So if you have someone from the East Coast and the West Coast, you might have a, a little bit longer, a 20 minute break so that they can have some time to, to grab something in case meetings are long or whatever might happen. So. Awesome. Thanks, Tara. Actually, I did want to comment one thing on the um, time zones because I was the only one who was on a different time zone, and um, and I teach primarily in an online um, format right now, and I'm so used to saying Central Time Zone for everybody, and and so. Um, Thankfully, um, the one issue that I did have um, it happened to be with the other team members and not with the regular meeting um, with that. But um, after that, I had to um, set, I just set alarms <laughs> and just double checked everything. So every single meeting had an alarm set just to make sure I was not missing um, any time zone kind of related things. And so I could picture if you're on um, time zones that are much more drastic um, than the time zones we had, um, that that really could um, be something that people need to watch. Definitely, yeah, that, you know, we, we did try, um, I, I try my best a little bit to see some alignment. Um, some of the visits, um, Kelly, you know, everyone was in the same time zone as the uh, visit as well, so everybody is really lined up. Um, as you mentioned, Kristen, um, with your visit, the folks were lined up with the institution's time zone. I'm um, going I believe for Marty's visit, um, maybe one of the team members, or two team members were lined up um, sort of with the institution and one at, you know, Marty was obviously on the East Coast. Um, so, you know, we look at that a little bit. It would be possible in some cases to do that really well, in other cases not as well. It's kind of the same thing as travel, you know, when we look at where folks come from, how far they have to travel. Um, we do we sort of make that effort uh, to line some of that up. Uh, I saw Robert raise a hand. Uh, Dr. Rofsky, do you want to pop in with something? Sure, thanks, Jonathan. Um, just want to thank everybody for being here this afternoon and hope everybody is safe and well. Um, we are obviously going to be experiencing a backlog of visits, so your assistance over this um, next period is really going to be essential for us. Um, you know, we had to cancel all of our spring visits, and that's going to just kind of have a ripple effect. <clears throat> um, if you don't want to do a virtual visit, if you're feeling uncomfortable with it at all, just <laughs> excuse me. Please just let let us know. It's not a problem. Um, beyond that, uh, I just want to, we want to know what your questions are. We want to know what your concerns are. 
and we're going to build this as we go. So just let us know. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Um, like I said, uh, you know, I just want to open up the floor for any questions that folks have. Um, as Robert mentioned, you know, some of these things are kind of learning as we go along, adding to the playbook, so to speak. Uh, we learned a lot from our pilot visits. Um, we learned a lot from some of uh, some things we've learned from other specific creditors uh, that have been doing uh, these virtual visits for a little longer than us. We've seen some things they do that work for us, some things that don't, um, and we're making adjustments as we go and uh, trying to, to meet everybody's needs, both. Uh, site visitor needs and uh, the team. So uh, yeah, I'll just open up the floor. Matt. Um, thank you for this training. It's uh, really appreciated. I, I know a little bit, Jonathan, this is about looking into a crystal ball here, but I'm wondering with this shift to virtual site visits, whether this is gonna become a permanent option for programs, it seems like it would make sense from a financial standpoint to go for the uh, virtual uh, visit. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about this becoming permanent. I'll say at this time, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are planning this to be time limited. I do. I will say, as of this moment, I imagine it going through fall and spring of this coming academic year, um, at a minimum. Uh, so that that's kind of what's on the table right now. Beyond that, you're right. Uh, it's looking into a crystal ball. I, I can't say for sure uh, that it won't be permanent after that, but I, I feel confident saying that uh, we'll be running it in the fall and the spring of, of uh, the next academic year. Sure. And, and I'll just add to that. This, it is important to realize, Matt, this is an emergency response on KCREP's part to the current context. So there have been no discussions about moving forward with it on, you know, the, we're going to be talking with the board at the upcoming meeting just to kind of bring them, you know, fully up to speed on the virtual visits and what's been done to date. Um, we do know, you know, there's a limited number of accreditors that are, been, we, we really benefited. I'll, give a huge shout out right now to um, CoAmpty in this regard because they had actually been moving in the direction of virtual site visits before COVID hit. So they were, uh, you know, so they had done a very planned and purposeful exploration of virtual visits and the entire accreditation community really benefited. Um, you know, they, they held a webinar for um, accreditors, they were shared resources. Um, so we were able to learn a lot in a very short amount of time uh, that really helped us kind of jumpstart into doing this. Um, again, this is an exploratory. We learned a lot just from the three pilot visits that we've done. Um, there are a number of programs that originally we said this probably wouldn't fit for that, you know, I think as we gain more experience, we're going to be able to go back and revisit that and, you know, reconsider you know, there are some programs that just have a high level of complexity to them. And right now we are not considering them, you know, eligible for a virtual visit. If it seems prudent and appropriate in the future, we may, um, you know, because the, the virtual format gives us some flexibility to consider things that we haven't had to consider before. So for example, a high level, um, a high, high level complexity program, we may not have to be constrained to the three day visit that we would normally be constrained to, but could be shorter segments with a smaller team working over an extended period of time. So that may open up some possibilities for us um, and for programs, but we want to make sure that we're doing it in a very purposeful and, and reasoned approach. Um, and so I, what I'm thinking is, you know, we're going to try to start with the programs that fit the best and then, you know, we'll work up from there in terms of complexity and we'll continue to learn and build as we go. Um, let me just say one other thing is that we're really gonna be reliant on you as team members, team chairs to communicate if during the course of a visit, in, in the same way with a in-person visit, but if there's something that you really ultimately don't feel like you had the opportunity to um, fully review or if there's you know a group that you didn't feel were 
very well represented during the visit or something, you know, we're really reliant on you to communicate that in the report because then the, the, the institution would have, you know, other opportunities perhaps to respond to that. So you may notice in the supplement, what we're saying is that we would, we really want them to be able to provide you with some sort of a virtual tour of their facilities, especially their clinical instruction facilities. That may not be feasible for some of the programs, at least at this current time, because they can't get on their campuses. Um, we've heard from other accreditors, I, some of the institutional creditors, I think there was one where uh, they did a drone, <laughs> they, they sent up a drone with a camera and they actually flew oh. over the campus and pointed out different, that was very cool. Um, I don't think that would necessarily work for our, for our purposes, but what we're basically saying is if, if they're not able to provide that to the team at the time, you know, that the team would indicate that is not met, but there may be other opportunities, whether it's um, in their institution response when maybe their context has changed or even if the board issued a two-year accreditation they would give them more opportunities to to actually fully fill in that that missing piece thanks very helpful other questions I have a question. Thank you for all the information. Uh, I'm a newbie, uh, so it may be it may not be a appropriate question. But uh, did you guys find it um, useful to record the sessions, the the Zoom sessions during the site visit, or what are your thoughts on it? Yeah. So, so we actually, uh, yeah, we actually specifically um, did not record any of the visits and we specifically in our agreement um, if you look over the agreement we signed with institutions uh, we specifically said we expect them to not record any of the sessions um, and we do that just for integrity of the process really uh, you know we could certainly make some sort of an agreement with an individual program to say hey we'd like to do an overview of how do some of these meetings work or, or things like that um, I don't know that this process and at this stage that that's something that we would uh, would look at just because um, it is so new. If we get a little bit down the road or there, there was something that we thought was, was uh, there was a lot to be gained there, uh, you know, we may consider it. Um, but I think that there's, there's some sensitivities. And as we said, this being an emergency kind of a, a, a thing, uh, we felt that there, there were too many liabilities in, in trying to uh, have something like recordings or things. Um, you'll note that, that we're using, uh, that, that we note in that handout that we're using a HIPAA compliance system. We want everyone to feel confident that everything they say is confidential in those meetings, just as we uh, want to ensure that when we have on-site visits. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, that got me thinking of something um, else. Um, I For our meetings, the, the chat box was disabled. And at first I remember um, thinking, oh gosh, that'd be so handy if it, if it wasn't, like if we did have access to do that. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, no, I'm really glad it was disabled because like when we go in, in person, uh, we don't sit there and pass notes to each other, you know, and also um, I wouldn't want um, the people um, like whoever is in the meeting, I wouldn't want them to be chatting with each other. Hey, make sure you say this. Hey, make sure you say that. Or oh, I wonder why they brought that up. That's interesting. Or um, And so I actually really appreciated that that judgment call was made. It took a while for me to kind of process that through, but in the end was really grateful that um, you disabled them. Yeah, that was uh, definitely one of those, as Robert mentioned, uh, lessons learned from our partners. Uh, Coming up, you shared that that was something they did. And exactly what you said, uh, Kristen is the exact reason for doing that. People start passing notes in private messages to somebody else, uh, or, or just the chat is disrupted because it's kicking off and lighting up and, and everything like that in the middle of the, uh, you know, the middle of things. Uh, so, so that's one reason yeah, we, we chose to uh, Hello. Ah.
This is Carl Shapiris. I just wanted to piggyback on Matt Buckley's comment. You know, I, I recognize there's a, the emergency response with the pandemic, but I, I'm sure everyone's aware that universities across the country are experiencing major deficits in budget that are going to have a ripple effect for the next couple of years. So I hope there's a, a strong consideration for this maintaining a, a virtual site option because I think it'll be an impact that we'll see across counseling programs in budget operations. Yeah, if, if nobody's going to jump on this, I just had one other question um, for uh, Neil and Kelly and Marty. I my experience as a team chair is that I the nuances that occur with particularly student and alumni meetings are very very powerful around nonverbal being able to see how people are kind of bouncing off of one another. Did you sense any diminishment in your ability to? really get not only the spoken but the unspoken story in those interviews with students and alumni particularly and then maybe if you have comments about faculty and uh, supervisors i didn't see a lack of um the ability to get those nuances uh, of course, you know, I, my mind not be not might not be working as hard as your, yours is, uh, Matt, in the process. But um, you know, our students were fairly uh, students were were open more open than I've seen before. Um, you know, I've we've been to somewhere students talk sit around and talk about how great the program is and um, how much they love it, and that could be very true. At the same time, uh, they're shy to say some things that are challenges for the program. I, I didn't see that uh, be uh, diminished at all um, in the group of students or site su supervisors um, that I spoke to in the process. In fact, there's a little bit, uh, there's a little bit of security maybe in, in speaking to it into a computer than speaking to it face to face where people feel a little more uh, open um, in some cases to, to share their mind. Thanks, Marty. Good to see you, Matt. My my perspective is the same. I think that there was some some built in anonymity in a sense. Uh, plus, we had we had more students, so in some ways, I think we gathered more information. Along those lines, um, did you require people to um, activate their video, or could they not have their video on? Yeah, that's. I would just um, add though, oh, I'm sorry, Marty. You go yeah, ahead. I was gonna, I'm sorry, Kelly. Uh, they, having the chair introduce the, the, the team to the rest of the group help and with the video on helps verify sort of that we're talking to their students and not somebody who just decided to drop in on the student's account. So it, it adds a layer of verification um, and you know, and then to have the liaison leave 
uh, from the group is, is good, so. And all I was gonna add, I think it's a great question, Sherry. It, what it reminded me of is what I've had to do when I teach on Zoom, which is to just sort of say what the expectations of our time together. So just do those good reminders of, um, you know, when, when I would be made the host of the room, I would say, okay, I'm gonna mute everybody. And that's just to cut down the background noise. So be sure to come off mute. Uh, if you have a comment or you can use the little hand raise function. And I invite everybody to be on video just so that we really can be sure that we're um, you know, putting the face to the name uh, as you're sharing your thoughts. So, I mean, Jonathan's right, of course, it's in the agreement, but the liaison can't always control what people are gonna do when they're in a room. So it is sometimes up to uh, the site team members and chair to kind of set those expectations in the meeting. And, and I would always just do it as a request um, if somebody was not on video when they started. And sometimes I had one person say, well, I'm, I'm in transit. I'm like walking from my car and I can't be on video yet, but I'll get on video when I get to where I'm going. And that was fine. Yeah, I think ultimately some of the requirements that we're, we've put in place, um, and again, I would encourage you know you to sort of be very familiar with that supplement because that does lay out these different parameters, and so you'd be able to kind of pick up you know in planning on some of these elements is really in some ways for the protection and integrity and of the of the visit itself. Um, you know, you you kind of have a sense of who's sitting in the room. You know, like I remember being on a visit. <laughs> forever ago at this point, I guess it was, um, you know, where the faculty liaison just kind of was going to sit in with a group of students and, you know, the team chair was like, well, we, we'd really, you know, invite you to leave very nicely, of course, um, because we really wanted to have that freedom and flexibility to, you know, to, to interact. And that's why we really want to know who's in the room, make sure that it is just representatives of the different uh, constituent groups. And, and there's some tools that are built into Zoom that make that very helpful. At the same time, you know, you have to manage manage those, um, you know, the waiting rooms. And that's why we want to know what the names of the people are. And we're asking that people really be in their own rooms, you know, uh, just with one person logged on, you know, to each entry rather than having multiple groups of people sitting in the same room and things like that. So. Thank you. Jonathan, you've made, and Robert, you just made a reference to a supplement. Where do we get that supplement? I don't, I don't yeah. locate that. Okay. Thanks. Hi, this is Justin Malka. I have a, a quick question, and I don't, I don't know how, um, what the likelihood of this being even a, a, a possibility or an issue, but in the likelihood event that uh, a, a program could not uh, provide a uh, in real time virtual video, video tour of any of the facilities, um, would a uh, potential alternative what what if the the request was can we because of maybe time restrictions uh, uh the, the liaison or someone else provides that type of pre-recorded uh, uh guide or video tour uh or does it have to be in real time 
Oh no, 100% just in the expectation would be that it would be something that would be recorded and made available okay, to great. the team. There's no no expectation of anything in real time. Um, well, okay. and this, is, this is Beth Boland. We're in Washington State. I can't get into my offices. And so I think, you know, I'm also up for a virtual visit. So I got the um, that side of things too. So it sounded like we could uh, request to defer, uh, you know, kind of a pass on that if we can't get into our space. I mean, it wouldn't be so much of a, as a pass, but mm -hmm. a recognition of, you know, we're not, the team isn't able to verify right. this. Right, not and a pass, we'll yeah, thank at you. Another date. Um, again, this is one of those areas where we encourage flexibility. It could be, you know, video may not be feasible. Maybe somebody just has some pictures of their lab or something like that, that they're able to, you know, put into a PowerPoint or something like that. It's just the goal is, again, that, that the team is able to, to verify the information and things like that. And if it can't be done during the course of the visit, then, you know, then it would need to be done at a later date. And I just would add, Robert, I think, you know, for Neil and Marty and I, maybe because all of the institutions that we visited were primarily distance education institutions, um, we, at least in my visit, there, there was none of that, Beth. We didn't have a pre-recording of anything on campus. We didn't have, I mean, it really was just the conversations with all of the different people to verify the information that was in the self-study, in the addendum, um, and on the website. Um, so, and I really felt very confident that our team was able to verify what we needed to verify just through those means. Thanks, that's helpful.